We've been walking around as we've been doing uh, our, our Advent series uh, under the topic of the gift exchange. And um, I assume some of you have done white elephant gift exchanges. And some white elephant gift exchanges are, are nice white elephant gift exchanges. You bring something nice and everyone brings something nice. And some are garbage uh, things where people are just handing things out. I was in a small group, I don't know, six, seven years ago when I was in Kingwood. And um, we had a white elephant gift exchange for our small group. And so my wife and I came prepared, I guess, for ours. And someone walked into the group and looked around and saw everyone had bags in their hands. And they're like, hold on. And they go back out to their car and they come back with something, right? And you know in that moment, whatever's in that person's bag... It was just something laying in their trunk, right? right? It wasn't the best of gifts. And you know, sometimes you come into the gift exchange and you don't have the best thing to give, but you may walk, or walk away with something so much better. In this Christmas season, as we prepare our hearts for Christmas, I'm encouraging you to give God something and let God give you something back in return. And so um, today we're going to talk about anger. Anger and hatred, you know, the, one of the major issues that we deal with in the world today is something that is so natural and so easy. It is so easy to be angry and bitter towards people who've done us wrong, right? It's just the most natural of things. If, if you've been wronged, and there's probably not a person in this room who's older than like five years old who hasn't been wronged by someone, who doesn't have a reason to carry a grudge, who doesn't have someone who's just absolutely done them wrong, right? And, and as we stand uh, in, in that situation, when we've been wronged, it becomes very easy for us to become embittered towards the person, and that bitterness can turn to anger and to hatred. And, and I want to tell you something. Hatred is a dangerous game to play. When Jesus came to, to earth, he came uh, to bring the fullness of love, to demonstrate what love is truly all about. And today we're going to talk about the opposite of hatred, the opposite of this anger that fills our hearts, and that's the love that is shown through, through the Christ coming. We're going to be in the book of 1 John today. 1 John is uh, pretty deep in your Bible. I mean, like this is the back of my Bible, and there's only about this much left. So um, it precedes 2 John and 3 John, which makes sense. Um, but it's after all of Paul's letters and James, and then you'll run into the John's. Um, I guess right after Peter's as well. Um, but we're in 1 John chapter 4. John is writing this letter. Um, and the, kind of the point of 1 John is uh, to talk about how we as believers can know God intimately. We can abide with God and God can abide with us. And that picture of abiding with God is kind of difficult um, for us to, to get our heads around sometimes. But really all it means is that we will be in God. Like our lives will be caught up with him. And then likewise, there's a promise that when we abide in God, God will abide in us, right? And there's something about salvation there, but also something about peace and joy and love and hope that we'll experience fully because we have the abiding presence of God. 1 John chapter 4 is where we are. We're going to be reading from verses 7 to 12 to start with, uh, and then we'll, we'll jump down a little bit and, and get to the end. It says this, starting in verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this, uh, uh, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12 says, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God abides in us, and his perfect love, or his love is perfected in us. Guys, what I, what, I, what I love about what John is doing here as he dives in to talk about the issue of love is he starts with an understanding of what love is. Love is, is a tricky concept by itself, right? Because we have like the Hallmark movie, Love, right? Big town city girl moves back to small town, meets the lumberjack, falls in love, gets married, right? I mean, I, my wife, praise the Lord, does not care about Hallmark Movie Channel, 
Um, and so those aren't on nonstop, but some of you have probably seen about 97 of those this Christmas break. Is, are you talking about Jenny or at, at Tammy? Oh, going over to Tammy. Okay, good. Right, some of us have seen our share of Hallmark movies, right? And, and, and this picture of love is kind of this it, it, a romantic sweeping away, and you, and you get lost in this thing. And all right, all right, love is, it, there is an emotional component to love, right? If you've ever loved someone, right? And I hope you have, but if you've ever loved someone, there's an emotional component to it, but love that we experience, right, that we, we, we emotionally experience, is really just kind of a piece of who God is, right? God is love. The definition of love has to include the God who created and, and wholly encompasses what love is. Devoid of God, our love is empty and vacant, right? Devoid of God, our love is substandard and turns up becoming really, it can become more of an obstacle or a hindrance, than what it's supposed to be. God is love. And the way God demonstrates love to us, right, is in the, in the face of Jesus Christ. We see it in the Old Testament where God demonstrates his love by continually renewing the covenant with the Israelites. But in the New Testament, God is love through the incarnation. When Jesus came to be born in a manger, God's love was poured out to mankind. God said, I love you enough to become one of you. I love you enough to get down on your level, to to go through the world like you've gone through. And then we know the end of Christ's story, right? He doesn't just love us enough to come be with us. He loves us enough to die on our behalf, right? It says, you know, know, greater love has no other than, than, than that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus did that, right? He demonstrated sacrificial love, denying himself every step of the way throughout his earthly life. And then at the end of his life, giving his life away, giving his life away so that you could experience forgiveness. So you could experience salvation. So you could experience um, joy unspeakable. Love laid down his life for you. God is love. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that God is love, right? Sometimes we have a bad image of God because we're, we're living in sin and we experience the just part of God, and God is just and he judges sin, but he's loving the whole way through. The reason God is just, the reason God judges you in your sin is because he is loving, right? He doesn't want you to live eternally wandering away from the best things in your life. The story of the Garden of the Eden is, is, is a great story, right? Adam and Eve are there, Eve eats the fruit, gives the fruit to Adam. Adam eats the fruit. God had already told him not to do that. God sees what happens to them, and then he intervenes in their life. The first sin has been committed, and immediately God is back in the story, walking through the garden alongside of them, lovingly rebuking them, correcting them, disciplining them, and then he kicks them out of the garden. Right, and we think that that is like a, a punishment, that they were removed from the Garden of Eden, but it wasn't a punishment that they were removed from the Garden of Eden. It was grace that they were removed. It was love that they were removed. Because God said, look, if they stay in this garden and they eat from the tree of life, they'll live forever. And living forever in a broken, sin-sick world is bad. And God said, that is not what's in the best interest of these people, for them to live forever broken and sinful. So he kicked Adam and Eve, our our ancestral parents, out of the garden where death and, and decay would reach our bodies. But he did that because he loves us enough to protect us from living in eternity of sin and separation. And God does that again through the life and death of Jesus Christ, where he knows that the end game for all of us is eternal separation from him. Jesus comes in his fullness of love, becomes flesh, becomes incarnated, so that you don't have to live eternally separated from him. Love is coming and being present in the life of those that you care for. Now, now we're we're in the Christmas season, and we have family gatherings. This week I've had uh, my family in town, or technically my wife's family, but they've been around me since I was... You know, I met my wife in third grade. I've shared this story, right? Third grade Sunday school, Sunday school class. That's why you should take your kids to Sunday school. By the way, they might meet their wife. But um, I was third grade Sunday school class, walked in there, saw my wife, said, I'm going to marry that girl one day. And sure enough, I made it happen. No, um, but, but I did. It was long ago. 
know my in-laws forever, but I've had them in town. They'll be leaving this afternoon. That was, that was a promise right there, guys. It's on the books. No, but they've been in town the last several days. My, my brother's going to be coming in town today, maybe. I don't really know what his schedule is. I'll see my parents over this. I'll see um, my grandma, my aunt. Uh, I'll see all sorts of family members over this holiday season. And, and you know what's beautiful about that is when you get to live among the people that you care for. Right? Love is made manifest when you come alongside of them. That's what Jesus did. He came alongside of us on this earth so that he could demonstrate love to us. It's very difficult to demonstrate love from afar. You've got to come down and come near. Christ loved us enough to come near to us. He drew near to us, and God's love was made manifest in Christ Jesus. The other thing that this passage in verses um, 11 and 12 talks about, and 12 in particular says, you know, no one's seen God, right? We don't have a picture of God. We don't have a, you know, we have a stained glass over here of, of, of what Jesus would look like if he was carrying sheep and um, like, like, whatever, that's great. But that, but he probably didn't look like that anyways, right? But no one has ever seen God. We don't lay our eyes on God, but one of the ways that we can feel and know and witness God is by loving one another, because when we love one another, God abides in us. When I love uh, my wife faithfully in a God-honoring way, when I love her selflessly and when I deny myself for her, she sees God in me. Right? And that's, that's, that's not because I'm some holy, righteous person. It's because when you do the things that, that, that God does, you reflect some of who God is. You want God to be present in this world. You want people to, to see the glory and majesty of the divine. Love people. As you love people, God will abide in you. And when they see you, they will glimpse the glory of God. Right? You get to take part in being a, a manifestation of God's glory to people today. But the thing that prevents that for us is the thing that a lot of us hold on to with individuals. If you jump down to verse 20, uh, John continues, he says, Look, if anyone says, I love God, that's us church people, we like saying that, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he, can't, whom, whom he has seen cannot love God whom he hasn't seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now this means your biological brother, which could be more difficult than some of your spiritual brothers, right? Uh, I have two brothers, um, and they're both lovable at times. Right? I grew up with them, I, I fought with them, I wrestled with them, we covered each other. You know, one of my favorite stories about my brothers, this really doesn't connect, but I still like it, um, is my school would send, y'all are like, now teachers today are very like big brothery, right? Y'all send like grades and they're all like electronic and parents can log in and watch grades as they get put in. But back in the good old days, they would just send home a progress report every three weeks. And we would go and my brother and I would get the mail and then we would go down, our mailbox is kind of a community mailbox, so we go down, we get the mail, we would open our progress reports, and if either one of us had grades that would be deemed as unacceptable to my parents, we would walk by a storm drain, and we would throw it in there. And I don't know what happens when you put stuff in the storm drain, I guess it just disappears, right? And so very rarely were my parents ever delivered a progress report. I don't know if they know Fort Bend ISD even gave progress reports our whole childhood because they all ended up in the storm drain because one or the other of us would not be doing well and my parents loved us enough not to ask any questions right and so we couldn't do it with report cards progress reports and eh, doesn't even matter right uh, and so we would throw our, our our grades down the down the storm drain right my brothers and I we loved each other it's easy sometimes to love them but boy sometimes it's hard to love your brothers right or your sisters you know, I, I get the privilege and the opportunity to do funerals on a regular basis, and I get to watch families interact with each other. And sometimes they're, they're, they're healthy, and they've, they've gone through things, and they're, they're processed everything, but sometimes they are unhealthy. And it's, and it's sad, because you've got baggage that's drawn up. You've got things that have gone on. Guys, if you're carrying on to baggage, and this isn't just against your brother, if you're carrying on baggage against the person who's hurt you or harmed you, 
Some of y'all have had some really cruddy relationships in your life. Maybe it was with your parents. Maybe it's with a previous spouse. Maybe you've had a marriage that fell apart, and you just can't let that go. Maybe it was a, an ex-girlfriend who cheated on you with your best friend. I don't know. But if you've got some people in your life who've done you wrong, You've got to understand, you can't rightly demonstrate the love of God and claim that God's love is abiding in you while you hate the people, while you harbor um, huge amounts of resentment towards the people who God made in your image. Uh, Just a quick little story. Before I started dating my wife, um, I was dating another girl, and I was strictly forbidden from dating this girl. This is interesting because I'm a Baptist preacher, um, that some parent would find me not morally suitable to date their daughter but I wasn't according to these parents morally suitable to date their daughter and full disclosure I probably wasn't morally suitable to date their daughter you know what happens whenever parents say you can't date this kid is uh, all of a sudden kids become extremely sneaky Uh, and so we had like this like secret Romeo and Juliet weird uh, star-crossed nonsense You you can just imagine it was stupid I was 15 ish plus or minus, um, when this was going on. I can look back on it and say, boy, I really mishandled that situation. But, but even while I acknowledge the parts that I played, there is a wound from that that's real for me. That, that, that girl's father, when speaking of me, he, he said, you shouldn't be with that guy. He's a rapist about me. I'd never touched his daughter in a way that would lead to any rape accusations. I'd never been sexually active in my life uh, up until that point. Like, I had no exposure to that. But this grown man, you know, probably older than I am now or about my age, looked at me, deemed me unworthy to date his daughter, and labeled me something that was just absolutely repulsive. I carried that for a long time. Like, not that I was a rapist, but I carried, like, I hate that guy because he's calling me things that's just flagrantly untrue. I ran into him at a funeral. I don't know, I'd been married for a few years by now. Um, I ran, I'm not getting on that, but I ran into him at a funeral. And I'll tell you what, I didn't know that I still harbored things against him. But I saw him and you try to be like, hey, how you doing? You know, but I couldn't even fake it. Like I just had to be like, I gotta go. Right? And it had been years. I was I don't know, it's probably five or six years after this, this accusation had come down against me. I couldn't fake it. It's like, I, 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 don't, I don't know what to do with this guy. Right? I had a, a bitterness in my heart towards this person. It's not like I thought about him every day. It's not like he informed the way I communicate with other people. But when I was with him in that moment, it became very clear to me. Yeah, Matt, you're not, you're not over that. You're not over that. And so I had to work diligently, and this was another year or two after that encounter that I kind of became convicted of my anger and my bitterness towards him. And I had to release that. Or I had to find a way to let that go. And if this man was to come to church Sunday, I wouldn't have a problem with him being in here. I mean, I probably wouldn't have shared this story, um, but, but I, I, wouldn't, right, I wouldn't have a problem with him being here. I wouldn't have an issue going up to him and shaking his hand and asking him how his life's going and actually meaning the things that I would say to him because I've released those things. But guys, if you're holding on to that bitterness, I want you to know it harms who you are, and it's impossible to, to, to look like Christ and to look like the love of God and hold on to hatred. And so what, are, what do you need to do? You need to hand that over. How do you hand over your hatred? How do you hand over that thing and exchange that for the love of God? If you were to look at, in, in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus deals with the issue of, of, of how to deal with our enemies, right? You know, you've heard it said, you know, love, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, right? But hate your enemies. And Jesus is like, no, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Guys, here, here's the way you fight against rage that's uncontrolled in your life. Here's the way you control or you fight with, with hatred and anger that's unresolved in your life. You pray for that person. First time I became aware of this, I thought, oh, okay, I can pray for that person. And you go into Psalms, and there's some prayers in the book of Psalms that really fit, like dash their heads upon the rocks. And no, no, you need to pray for their best interest. That means you pray that God would bless them. You pray that God would be revealed to them. You pray that, that you could be restored into relationship with them, whatever that is. 
right? If you were hurt by someone in your past, it doesn't mean going back and becoming buddy-buddy with them, but it does mean being able to look towards them without bitterness in your heart. And that as you sit down and their name comes into your mind while you're praying, you don't immediately think of the harm and the hurt and the, and the anger that they've caused you to have. Instead, you're able to pray faithfully for their good. For God to work providentially in their life, to push them towards better things, pray for them. And as you pray for those people, it becomes very difficult to hold on to grudges. If you're asking God to bless someone, it becomes difficult to be a thorn in the side of the person that you're asking God to bless. Your prayer life is exceedingly important in all areas of your life. And so one of the things that I want you to work on as we move into 2020, one of the things we're going to be working on as a church is we're going to be focusing on our prayer lives a lot. And one of the ways we're going to do that is on Monday evenings, we're going to have a, a prayer meeting. Um, and this will be probably not totally dissimilar from an old school Baptist prayer meeting. Um, Jonathan Ritchie is going to help coordinate that. And the way that's going to work is we're going to meet up here and we're going to pray. We're going, to, we're going to talk about how to pray. We're going to talk about things to pray for. And then you, we're just going to get together and we're going to pray. Because your prayer life is how you, you surrender your anger and begin to look like love. Your prayer life is how you let go of worry and anxiety and take on peace. All of the things that we want to exchange from our life to receive better gifts for, your primary weapon in that battle is prayer. Your primary weapon is prayer. And so as a church, we're going to be focusing on our prayers. We're going to be intentional about how we pray. We're going to have times where we get together to pray. And in our congregational meetings, we're going to pray earnestly seeking God to work because prayer is the tool to make us more like Christ. And as Christians, that should be our goal, to look like Christ. Guys, I, I want to encourage you to be active in your prayers. Think about the things you need to pray about and to pray for those things. Think about the blessings that God has given you and thank God for those blessings in your prayers. And as you pray, you will look like the one who you pray to. You know, the more you spend time with someone, the more you look like them, for better or worse, if you spent 70 hours a week with me, you would start to look and act like me or I like you. I don't know if that would be good or bad for you, honestly. It might not be the best thing for you to look and act like your pastor on a day-by-day -day basis. But if you spend, you know, 60, 70 hours a week with God in prayer, in His Word, communicating with God, you'll begin to look and act like Him, and I can promise you that will be a good thing for you. It'll be a good thing for you. It'll be a good thing for this community to have people who look like Jesus Christ today. Guys, if you've got hatred in your heart today, if you've got a, a someone in your mind that you've just, you can't let it go, a boss, a spouse, a former friend who did you wrong, a child who, who went wayward, today's the day to begin to take up your prayers for them. <clears throat> And to pray for God's blessing in their lives daily. Add it to your list. I'm bitter about this person. First step is acknowledging you've got a problem. And then pray for them. And continue to pray for them. And to seek their good. Because it will ultimately benefit everyone for that to happen. Let's pray.